Hey, hey, hey. Well, welcome to part two of, uh, of the call. I uh, hope you enjoyed part one. So I want to talk to we just quickly, we covered off a couple of things last week. So we looked at the average Australian and, uh, and American, you know, makes a certain amount of money. And if you make more than 25 grand a year, you're, you're effectively going to at some point be a millionaire. And so we looked at a couple of different principles and habits of success when it comes to being a millionaire or even just having a millionaire mindset. And what are some of those distinctions of very wealthy people? But I want to give you a couple of avatars today on this call of different things and different ways that people think about money. So hopefully you can identify some of your own patterns of behaviors of success and self-sabotage. So there's probably six or so I want to go through. The first one is ignorance. So there's a lot of people that are ignorant around money. They don't have any value for money uh, or the positive impact it can have on their lives. And these types of people say all the time that money's not important to me. I don't really care about money. I'm not really motivated about money, right? But these same people can certainly feel demotivated when they don't have money or when they're not tr treated fairly or equitably. Um, so the first thing that most people struggle with is ignorance. They just don't know it. They don't understand it. They don't want to know it. They don't want to understand it. But they can't ignore, like you cannot care about money, but it you can't ignore or not care about the impact that it has on your lives or the lives of those around you as well. And if you're saying that to somebody that something's not important to you, well, then it's pretty clear why those things wouldn't be one attracted to you, come to you or be easy for you. And so, you know, oftentimes when someone says that, that they just don't care about money, or I don't value money or, or I don't have an awareness of it. It's just that simply put, they've never been educated. And so they feel disempowered. So the first thing that some people have as a pattern around money is ignorance. Second one is splurge. These people don't believe that money's going to hang around very long. So they try to get rid of it as quickly or as impulsively as they can. And they make very impulsive short-term decisions. So I don't have a lot. So it's like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to try and get rid of it as quickly as possible before somebody takes it from me. And I remember once I had a client that uh, I was asking about money. And he said, the more money you have, the more they take. I said, who's they? You know, he says, well, you know, I'm talking about they, those people. I go, actually, I have no idea who you're talking about, right? Are we talk about the government. Are we talking about your ex-partner? Are you talking about your kids? Are you talk about like who? Are you talk about yourself? And so we use this language right around, you know, it's going to it's gonna come, it's going to go pretty quickly. Um, and so a lot of people just have this idea of, well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make any money in the future. I haven't made a lot of money in the past. So if I've got it, I'm going to fucking blow it because you know what? I'm here for a good time, not a long time. And what that traditionally will represent is one, somebody that doesn't represent, doesn't understand or appreciate the long-term value of money and what it could mean for them in the future. Somebody that also doesn't have a high level of confidence in their ability to be able to manage money well. And also somebody that doesn't have a high level of confidence that money is going to flow freely in the future. So why would I want to wait for the future? Like the idea of being conscientious and delaying gratification and working tremendously hard. That only works if you're in an environment where you feel there's some structure and stability and that the future is going to be better than the present. If you don't believe the future is going to be better than the present, you'll blow all the money you've got because it's like, why would I wait? The future is going to be worse. I may as well have better now and not and just say, fuck it to the, to the, to the future. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of people that have that mentality where I just, I just splurge, right? Because it's like, I want to live in the moment. And oftentimes as well, people will use money as an escape from reality. So if I'm under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, uh, I've got anxiety or I've got problems and challenges in my life, I'll find, um, I'll find a way to meet my needs uh, through spending money. Now, you ultimately you have to spend money in nearly every other way as well, but you know, some people do it through drugs, some people do it through sex, some people do it through alcohol, some people do it through compulsive shopping. And it's like they just spend and spend and spend because when you spend money, you get a whole heap of those neurochemicals that you know flood your system. And so there's this constant desire to sort of splurge or, or, or give it away, right? You know, they've got it, then they give it. They've got it, then they give it. Next one is a complete opposite, which is very stingy. So these are the types of people that have, um, you know, they think that the, this is the last money that they're ever going to have. So it's not like, oh, hey, I'm never going to get any more. So fuck, let's live it up. It's I'm never going to get any more. So I've got to save for a rainy day. And they sort of squirrel away the money. They want to try and hold on to their money as much as possible. And they restrict the flow of money, limiting their ability to enjoy life. But whenever you restrict the flow of something, you also restrict the flow of it going out, but you restrict the flow of it going in. And so the idea is not to have it all just going out all the time, 
you know, the idea is to be able to, to control the flow, to manage the flow, to influence the flow in your life. And of course, to expand it as well. But there's going to be times when you need to and be splurge and there's going to be times when you need to be stingy. But most people pendulum swing and they pendulum swing not based off how much money they've got, but because of their perception of how much money they had relative to what they've got or their perception of how much money they're going to have relative to how much they've got. So if you've just had a couple of big weeks and you've been splurging and going a bit nuts, not being really aware of your money, being ignorant, well, then more than likely, you're going to pendulum swing and become super fucking stingy and every dollar is going to count where on the flip side if you've been really stingy and you're you're feeling sort of trapped it's like being on a diet and you're being really restrictive then you're going to blow out and you're going to end up spending a whole heap of money on stupid shit and so the idea is that you want to instead of having any of these three you want to have a different uh mindset there's also the naive mindset around money or the pattern around money, right? Which, you know, these people preach sort of false abundance. So they're always talking about money and flow and abundance and trust and all that stuff, but they don't actually do any of the fucking work to earn any money or create any real value. And so it's, it's effectively ignorance mixed with a bit of spirituality, right? It's like, it's a double shot of ignorance with a chaser of spirituality. And so it's like, I don't really know anything about money, but I know there's money out there. So at least I'm not ignorant to the fact that there's no money in the world. I just don't know how I'm going to get any of this money. And so I think that if I just meditate, pray about it, affirm it, you know, use my incantations, my vision board, then that's going to be a thing that's going to help me get it. And, you know, these are the types of people that are under tremendous pressure and stress. But it's like, if you don't find, if you can't go forward, backwards, left or right, you don't know where you're going, you feel trapped. The only way for you to go is up. And so people end up looking for some sort of higher guidance or power or some sort of, you know, false God effectively in blessing them or guiding them in their lives. And most of the time, that's just the reaffirmation of saying, hey, are you actually showing up and doing the work? Because if you do the work and you focus on the things that matter, you'll win. And if you don't, you won't. So that's not to say that faith and, uh, and abundance and flow and all of that stuff I just mentioned, they're all real things. They're as real as you or I are or this camera or this, this computer screen that I'm looking at is. However, you to say those things, but not actually to follow through with the actions that are in alignment with them, that's what I'm talking about here. So just make sure that there's an important distinction. Next mindset is a hustler mindset. And this mindset's really about thinking about, I can justify things based off deals. So for a long time, my mindset, probably even up until the, the early part of this year, was predicated on the idea of anything that I wanted to do, I could justify based off it's just a set number of deals. So, you know, I always used to think about um, investment in things in terms of my business mentoring program. So you traditionally do that course of was about, you know, between two to 3000 a month. And so you're looking at between 24 and $36,000 a year. So making a decision, as long as I knew I could make at least a business sale, well, then it was all good because I could just justify the deal. And so it was about, okay, great money is in terms of deals and they can justify expenses based off that. Now, some people have that mentality anyway, but they don't have an unlimited earning capacity. So they can justify it, oh, it's just a week's wage or it's two weeks wage or it's a month's wage, right? So some people think about it in terms of that. Some people have got a deal maker's mentality where they're always trying to put something together and they think about money is an opportunity, then they, they think about it in terms of leverage. So uh, this is very much also like a salesperson's mentality as well, where they're thinking about closing a deal or making something happen. And it's always about like, I can do that. These people have got like side hustles and stuff, right? Or they, they're selling shit on gum place and gum place, Facebook marketplace or gum tree. I'm going to create my own place called gum place. And so we, you know, Liz, you can be the ambassador of gum place. I'm going to get Liz in one of those like um, uh, mascot suits but it'll just be like a fluffy version of Liz. It'll just be you. You won't, We won't have you dress up like an animal. It'll just be you. Uh, but just like in a much bigger costume of Liz. Anyway, welcome to gunplace.com. Let's see if we can register that domain. Uh, anyway, you get that thing I'm trying to mention, right? Which is like this, this hustling mentality of you know selling stuff or buying stuff and just trying to make little things happen all the time. And they're always trying to flip things. And there's just a mentality that people have with regards to money, which is it comes and goes. And I'm just trying to make a bit happen. And oftentimes in that mentality, there's a lot of activity, but not a lot of productivity. So yeah, sure, you might buy something for 20 bucks and flip it for 40 bucks, but you only made fucking 20 bucks. $20 is not a lot of money. You may as well have spent that same amount of time just doing your fucking job. You made twenty dollars an hour because it took you six hours to buy that thing, find that thing, flip that thing. So yeah, you made twenty bucks, but you could have made one hundred and twenty if you just worked overtime. So sometimes people miss the whole 
point of this, right? And then finally is an investor's mindset. And of course, there's a lot more money patterns than just these things. You understand that. But the investor mindset is it's it's about long-term decision-making and it's based off solid reasons, like logical reasons. And it's really centered around ROI, return on investment. If I spend this money today, what's going to be my payback period? Payback period means if I spend a dollar today, how long does it take me before I get that dollar back? That's my payback period. I'm also asking questions like, what's my return on investment? So if I give you a dollar and I make $2, I'm making 100% return on investment. If I give you a million dollars, though, and I only make one million and one thousand dollars, well, it's a pretty lousy return on investment. Yeah, it's great to make a thousand bucks, but I had to give you a million dollars to make that thousand dollars back. It's pretty low return on investment, right? So, uh, but if I give you a dollar and I make a thousand dollars, that's a much better return on investment. So it's all relative. You know, this is something that most people don't fully get when they're looking at with regards to small businesses. So a lot of people want to start their own business. You go, great, what's your return on investment? And they go, well, what do you mean? And you go, well, it's pretty straightforward. If you're investing 40, 60, 80, even 100 hours a week, what's your return on investment? Because if you went and got a job at your normal job and you say, hey, I want to actually work overtime. And instead of doing 40 hours a week, I want to do 60 hours a week. They go, okay, cool. And then what would I make doing that? Then I understand what the value of my dollar is in terms of my dollar per hour. If I go and work in a business and I'm making twice as much money, but I'm working three times as many hours, I've got a pretty lousy return on investment. So everything has to make sense on paper and try to be as objective as possible. So, you know, when you're selling a, a property, we used to have a real estate company and investors are notoriously difficult to get to hand over cash. And the reason why is because they're not emotionally invested. If you get a mom and dad with their kids and they walk through the house and they love the house and they fall in love with it, they'll pay so much money for it because they're emotionally involved because they've already seen themselves living in the kitchen and making breakfast at the breakfast bar. And they've already seen their kids playing in the pool at Christmas time. And you know they've already sold themselves on it. And so they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. But an investor that looks at the house goes, I don't give a fuck about the island bench. I don't care about the pool. In fact, I see an expense of the pool because now I've got to pay for pool maintenance and the salt and all the other stuff that goes into it. And so they, they're thinking about it in a completely different way. And so that's a very powerful mindset to have around money. Now, the idea is that you know, there's, there's probably a balance between all of these, which is a really healthy mindset and pattern around money, which is to go, I know how much I've got coming in. And I know how much roughly I need to have going out. And I know what my surplus is that's left over. And I use that money to have a good time. You know, I don't believe in this idea that you should just you know, scrimp, and save, scrimp and save your whole life so that at some point in retirement, you can live a great life. What the fuck is the point? We all know people that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s that didn't get that far, that died earlier than that, number one. But number two, I know plenty of people that are going to not have a meaningful life in their older years because their health is not that good. And so... You know, if I'm in my 20s and 30s and I want to have a good life now and I want to see the world, why would I delay that till later? If I'm just smarter with my money, I can do it. And I'll give you an example of it, right? So Ash and I, um, we've been super busy over the last couple of weeks, particularly since we've done our self-mastery event. That was the 1st of November. So 25 days since the event. Seems like a lot longer than that, but it's only been 25 days. And this last 25 days, put in some big hours. So as a result of putting in those hours, one, we're getting up early, we're going to bed late. So feeling a bit tired. But on top of that, we're not really meal prepping. We're taking, we're buying a lot of Uber Eats. And so I just want you to post up and guess how much money we've spent since the 1st of November to, I think I did the numbers on Sunday of the week. How much money have we spent on food and coffee and lunches and dinners in terms of takeaways from Uber Eats? Uh, so effectively, uh, it's broken down into restaurants and cafes. How much do you think we've spent in total since the 1st of November, right? I just put a post up because I did the numbers and I was, I was, it was pretty fucking horrific. I was like, this is, this is not good. Two and a half grand, Christine. Holy fuck, babe. Thankfully, it's not that much. Liz, $3,000. Holy shit. $3,000. What am I, Jordan Belfort? Just doing lines of Coke every day for lunch? Um, okay. Well, you guys make me feel much better. Jay, 500. Brennan, 650. Meryl and, and uh, Kirsty, not too bad. A uh, thousand bucks. Thousand bucks. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we ended up spending eighteen hundred dollars. Eighteen hundred dollars, which is a lot of money, right? Like it's a lot of money for anybody. Uh, it's a lot of money for us, right? Um, and I was like, "Fuck, eighteen hundred dollars on on nothing, like just on some dinners and um, on takeaway and fucking Nando's, right? Like we're not even eating extravagant meals. We only eat two meals a day anyway. It's just lunch and dinner and some coffees." But it's very quickly can add up where you're spending like a hundred bucks a day on uh, on food 
And, uh, and by the time you add in some coffees and a lunch and a dinner, it, you know, that's it. And it probably is more than that because that was just my account, not including Ash's account. So, you know, you get the idea. Now, that $1,800, you know, I look at that, I go, did that add anything meaningful to my life? No. If I was better organized and I was more conscientious with my money and if I was more aware of what was going on, I better plan my time. Did I have to spend that? No. And if I had my time to do it again, would I spend $1,800 on that? No, I wouldn't have. So in that case, it's not like I need to do anything fundamentally different other than pay attention to the fucking money, be aware of the fact that I'm spending too much money on these things and go instead, let's start meal prepping. So this week we meal prepped. We were smart with our money and we actually made a decision. We're not doing any Uber Eats. We deleted the apps from our phone until Christmas. So we're not going to do any Uber Eats. We're not going to do any of that. And also that'll probably also help me from a health perspective as well, probably lose some weight in that way. And also we'll save some money. And if I really want something, the idea of going to the shop and buying it myself, I mean, what a crazy concept that I have to fucking do it myself rather than paying for the convenience of having a delivery driver do it. But, you know, it's so impulsive to be able to buy that, right? So that one thing alone between now and Christmas is probably going to save us if we didn't change something, probably close to about three grand, right? By the time you add everything in. So that one thing, $3,000, what could I do with that instead? I'm going to think a lot of things. I can go to the Crown uh, and spend, uh, you know, probably a week at the fucking Crown. Uh, I could uh, invest that money into something important in terms of our business or in terms of property, or we could, you know, do something special for Christmas. Now, there's a lot of things you can do with the extra money that you're not aware of. And so you want to develop an understanding of understanding what's your patterns of behavior. I know for me personally, I'm a very generous person. And so when I've got a lot of money, I want to do nice things for people. And so, you know, I, and I've done that even when I haven't had a lot of money, but when I do have a lot of money and I'm feeling very flush with cash, I'm very abundant. I like to give away a lot of money. I like to spoil people with things. That makes me feel good. But I also appreciate as well that if I keep doing that and I'm not also cognitive or focused on the um, management of the money, after a while, I end up giving away a lot and then I'm left with not a lot. And then very quickly, I can start to get very angry and frustrated of like, why did I give all that money away? And so there's this really delicate balance that happens for that as part of that, right? Now, that's all just mindset. Right? There's no reason, there's no logical reason for that, but I'm giving because of emotion, but I'm also feeling frustrated when I don't have because of emotion, because it's all emotion. And so you've got to really understand what's your money mindset in terms of what's your emotions around money, because you will either find yourself doing very, very well because of that, or you'll do very poorly. And I do very well at making money because of those things. I also do quite poorly at spending money because of those things as well. And finding a balance between those things or a harmony, if you will, between those things is probably one of the most essential things that you guys can do. Does this make sense for everybody? Yeah. One of the biggest lessons I want to give you, though, is just keeping everything top of mind, right? Like just top of mind, whatever you pay attention to expands, right? Where focus goes, energy flows, results show. So people that focus on their money and check their accounts regularly do really well. So for me, a bit of a discipline, check the accounts every day. Check your bank account every day. You know, for us with our business, we've got an account called Stripe, which is our online payment processor. So I can, it can tell me how much money I'm meant to receive tomorrow and the next day as part of that. So I can be on top of that. And the more you're aware of it, the more you've got the insight in terms of where you're at. Now, it's not perfect, because there could be a bill that you don't know that's coming up for you in a month that you're just not aware of. And it could be a big one, right? So it, it's, it's not a perfect system, but it's good enough as a starting point because most people don't check their accounts at all. And I know I've certainly had this experience. I imagine many of you have where you go to pay for something on your card or your phone and the back of your mind, you're going, please go through, please go through, please go through, please go through. Oh, oh sorry. I'm just wrong card. Right. It's what you have to say when it doesn't go through. It's not, not the fucking wrong card. You just a broke motherfucker. You got no money in any cards. And so then you're like, oh, sorry, no problems. Yeah, just I've got money in a lot of currencies, you know, international business and stuff. But you've got to transfer money. I've got to just sell a couple of my you know, US investment properties just to pay for this fucking cappuccino for four dollars fifty, right? So you want to be in a position where you can pay pass and not have to worry about it. And you can pay pass and not have to worry about it by paying attention to it. That doesn't mean to say you have to worry about it, but you have to pay attention to it as well. And the more you pay attention to it, the better it's going to be. And I know for a lot of people, if you don't pay attention to it now, that monster is going to build into something that's really fucking significant. And I was having a conversation with a, um, a, a client of ours, one of our platinum clients, and he's at a place where he's making millions of dollars. They'd make probably more than a million dollars a month at the moment. So big, big numbers. And 
all of the stress and pressure that he's going through with regards to his business and the strategy and the mindset, all that stuff, it's all just getting to him to the point where he's like, I don't even want to look at it. I just feel sick just even thinking about it. And it just got too big and too ugly. And I just don't want to deal with it. Now, the reality is that's his ego making it seem much bigger, right? To justify all the hard work he does. So there's a whole pattern there. But the reality is it didn't have to get that big. It doesn't have to be a big thing that takes a month to figure out if you were just paying attention to it every day. Does it make sense? And my suggestion to you is incorporate it into a ritual for you that you're already doing. So hands up if right now you get a coffee, you go to a coffee shop and you get a coffee um, on a daily basis. Cool. No, Liz, you don't drink coffee. You get your Nespresso pot. I'm just making it at home. Okay. I'm a poor student of, again. Bit, bit of Nescafe Blend 43, I get it. Bit of Meccano, is it Meccano? Not quite on that peasant sort of stuff. Though. Not not that low. Is it a little net uh, espresso pot? No, it's a coffee machine. Oh, you have a coffee no, machine? Like I grind, I froth the milk. I do. All I right. am a barista in this. All house. right, so you are a barista. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You should update your LinkedIn profile. Well done. <laughs> um, funny story, right? For, this is a real funny story. So my cousin Indiana. Some of you know Indiana. We um, we were walking down to the coffee shop once. And uh, she picked up a business card that was on the ground and it was uh, from a lawyer, right? And it, I don't know, I, let's just say it had, um, it had, you know, um, uh, <laughs> the person's name and let's just say it was Ashley Coyles and it said, um, you know, lawyer and barrister. And uh, Indy says, wow, um, this person's a lawyer and they also make coffees. That's amazing. And I say, like, no, 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 Indy, a barrister is not the same as a barista. It's quite a different thing. Um, and if they were happen to be a lawyer and also a barista, I don't think they're putting the barista on the on the business card. Like they don't go to to university to be a barista. You know, lawyer degree is a bit different. So we have to explain the concept of what it means to be a barista. So yes, uh, barrister, barista, you can do all of that, Liz. So the point I'm trying to make, though, I got distracted with Liz there, was if you are doing that, like for us, when we go to order a coffee, if I'm ordering a coffee or if I'm making it at home, for example, it's like, great. While you put the order in for a coffee, you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs anyway, probably scrolling Instagram, waiting for something, right? Or whatever it is that you do on a daily basis that normally takes a bit of time. Might even be heating up your lunch in the microwave. In that two minutes or whatever it takes you to do that activity, that's enough time for you to log into your internet banking, check your accounts. Now, if nothing's changed from the last time you checked it, that's okay. If it's gone worse, that's okay. And if it's gone better, it's okay. It's just about having the awareness of it because most people never fucking check it. So you want to log in and check it regularly. And if it's not starting to change, you want to start to get pretty pissed off about it. Because if in order for something to change, you've got to change the way you approach it and the way you think about it and what you're looking at it as well. Does that make sense? So this would make a big, big difference. So here's some things I want you guys to do for homework. Number one is I want you to do some millionaire habits. Right. So think about some of the millionaire habits we talked about last week and hopefully you've got an awareness. I'm going to upload the slides today for you. So you get an awareness of it. I want you to read a book called Think and Grow Rich. Hands up if you've read this book. It is literally the uh, Napoleon Hill is the OG of personal development. Right. Um, nearly every successful text in personal development has originated from or drawn its origins from the principles of Think and Grow Rich. It was written in the 1920s by a gentleman called Napoleon Hill, and he was tasked by a gentleman called Dale Carnegie, who was one of the wealthiest men at the time. He was the first millionaire, I believe. And um, he was uh, tasked with the idea, oh, sorry, Andrew, not Dale Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, uh, was tasked with the idea of going out there and interviewing the 100 wealthiest men on the planet at the time. So this is the early 1900s, all the wealthy men in the world. He went and re uh, researched them on the Rockefellers of the world and the uh, JP Morgans of the world, researched them, interviewed them, asked them questions. And then he wrote a book about it called Think and Grow Rich. And he talked about those principles. That book is a staple of success. You can get it for free now online as well. It's so old that it's actually past the point of, of, um, of protection. So you can you download it for free. There's a ton of great audio books as well, but it is a good book to have as a staple in your collection. And if you just go to any secondhand bookstore, you'll be able to find a copy of Thinking Grow Rich. It's very, very well um, uh, distributed today. I would really seriously encourage you to pick that book up and this weekend sit down. It's not a hard book to read, not a long book, but you'll get a lot out of it and read that book. Uh, or if you prefer audio books, there's a ton of versions out there as well. Just find one that you like. You obviously won't get one from the author clearly because he's dead, but um, you, um, 
you know, he's, he's wealthy, but he's not that wealthy. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's worth, it's worth reading that book. And if, if that's all you did on the back end of this program, by the way, you know, that book's created more millionaires than any other book in the history of the world. I want you also to check your bank account for the next 30 days. Okay. When you check your bank account for the next 30 days. And if you want to add a little bit of extra to that experience as well, get all your money and actually start paying for things with cash and just see how far, uh, how quickly you stop spending money on shit when you've got to hand over physical cash for it. And then finally as well, this is an important one, and this could hopefully bring up a lot of good conversations, which is I'd love for you to discuss money with five key family members to see their money mindset. You know, the reality is that the money mindset, the beliefs, the emotions, the behaviors, the attitude that you have towards money, your patterns of behavior, you have inherited right? They, you, know, you know, they say the wealthy pass on their, you know, their money to their kids. Well, the poor pass on their poor thinking to their kids. And so do the wealthy, by the way, as well, because not every wealthy person thinks good about money. It's not, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but the idea is I'd love for you to sit down and talk to your siblings and to talk to your parents and to talk to your grandparents about money. Because what we have to be aware of is the negative thinking that we have today was probably the best thinking of its time 50 years ago. Like, just think about that for a moment. The negative thinking that we have today around a lot of things in life was probably the best thinking of its time 50 years ago. 50 years ago, the best thinking of the time was that smoking was good for us. 50, 50 years ago later, you know, the doctors used to prescribe that women smoke during pregnancy to help them breathe, right? What a fucking load of, load of shit, right? People used to, um, it was stuff with lead and everything else as well as part of that, right? There was a period of time where people used to take kids down asbestos mines to see mine sites, right? So 50 years ago, so we look at that time now, it's like, why do they have such a negative thinking? No, 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 their thinking was the best thinking of its time. 50 years from now, people are going to look at us like when they're Neanderthals, like those, those uh, half monkey, half human people, right? So the reference I want to give you, though, is to understand not just what their mindset is around money, but also where do you think they got that mindset? They got it from their parents. who got it from their parents. And so if no one, if you're the first person in your family to really be growth focused, well, you're going to challenge a lot of stuff because you're challenging the preconceptions and the pre-ideas. And let me share this, this story with you, which I think is quite timely because it's around Thanksgiving this week. So... I, um, I used to have a girl work for me called Caitlin, and she was uh, from America, from Philly, from Philadelphia. Awesome chick. I actually met her when I used to work in Bali with Chris Howard. She was part of the team there. And then when I came to Australia, she moved over to Australia and ended up working for me for about a year, I think. Anyway, while she's away from home, so this is her first probably two, three years away from home, missing family. It gets to this time of the year in November, which is part of me, Thanksgiving. Now, I never done Thanksgiving before. I never celebrated the holiday. It's really only an American thing, obviously. But I was like, hey, appreciate you want to do Thanksgiving. So she invited me and some of the other team members and some of her friends to her house for her first ever Thanksgiving. This is the first time, you know, you know, she, Caitlin was, I think, at the, point, at the time, 23, 24 years old. So it's like, you know, when you're a, a kid and you start, you know, like, I'm going to do this for the first time. And you don't realize how much work is actually involved in making that meal. Uh, and so I, I knew that she'd never done it before. And I knew that probably she had no idea what she was doing. So I headed over early. So I think dinner was at six o'clock. And I said, hey, I'm just going to be in the air a little bit earlier on. What time are you going to start making food? She's like, I'm going to start making it at two. And I'm like, okay, you probably need a bit more than that. But you're going to roast a fucking turkey. But uh, anyway, I headed over about two o'clock and I get there and there's a, the kitchen is a mess. I mean, she's trying to make pumpkin pie from scratch. She's got gravy. She's got, you know, veggies. She's only got one tiny fucking oven to start with. And, uh, and then she's trying to roast this turkey. And there's a whole heap of different things, organized chaos. And I look at her and you know the look of somebody that just realized how deep they are out of their depth, right? This is the look that's on this poor girl's face. So I go, okay, hey, how are you going? I said, look, what can I do? Let me get started or something. So I'm chopping some veggies up anyway. So then she's got this full fucking turkey, like a big, big bird. And she gets the knife and effectively she like breaks the, the legs off, right? And then she chops off like a good third of the top of the turkey and just discards it. And I'm going, that's not what you do with a chicken, right? You don't chop off, you chop off the head, obviously, but you don't chop off half of the top of the breast of the chicken and discard it. That don't make any sense. So say, hey, what are you doing with that other bit? She says, oh, that's mom just chops that bit off. So that's what we do. I go, that seems real fucking weird. And um, 
she says, well, that's just the way we've always done. I said, well, I think you're actually just wasting a whole heap of the, the turkey. Like, it costs you a lot of money to buy a turkey. Like, you bought a real fucking turkey. <laughs> so you may as well want to utilize it. And if not, you may as well cook it anyway and use it for other things. She says, okay, well, and, you know, she says, I'm actually speaking to mom in a little bit because of the time zone with the U.S., She's like, we're just going to get them just before they, I think they start their day. So I was just going to call them and wish them happy Thanksgiving anyway. So anyway, sure enough, a couple of minutes later, we get on the phone to her mom and she wishes everyone happy Thanksgiving, blah, 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 blah. And I say, excuse me, you know, mom, what, uh, what, what's the setup here? Because I'm here trying to help Caitlin. I'm putting this turkey in the oven, but she's got rid of the top third of this turkey and I don't know why you're getting rid of it because it seems like, you know, we wouldn't do that normally if we were cooking a chicken. So I'm just trying to understand what the thing is. She says, well, that's the way that grandma always cooked the turkey. That's what she did. She always used to chop off the top half of the turkey and we just have the second half. And I go, okay, that's really interesting. I says, a grandma there? And she says, yeah, grandma's there. I said, hey, grandma, Calvin here. I work with your daughter. I'm just trying to understand what the fuck y'all doing with your turkeys because I don't know why you're chopping off the top third of this turkey. She says, well, it's pretty self-evident, isn't it? I says, no. I says, well, because your daughter's doing it and your granddaughter's doing it. I still don't understand. She says, when we were growing up, the ovens were small and we couldn't fit the whole turkey in the oven. So we'd have to make the, the, the it would all have to fit into the dish. So we'd chop off the top third of the turkey and we would cook that later in the week. But we just use this base of the turkey to have the turkey meal and it would make it small so it would fit into our ovens. But it's not a problem today because you guys got a big fucking oven. And I go, right, so you're telling me that your daughter and your, your, your granddaughter have been doing this because they saw you do it. You never fucking explained that distinction to them? And so Caitlin's like, fuck, I never even thought of this, right? And so sure enough, she's fucking chopped this turkey in half. So we have this turkey, but it's actually two pieces of a turkey because she's trying to stick it back together again, right? But, you know, there's so many examples of little shit like that that people pass on from a family, which is like, this is the way that it's always been. So we never thought of doing it any different to that, right? So I share that with you. So I want you to get that cl clarity of people do shit with money all the time just because that's what they've always done with money. And so, you know, if that's the world you've grown up in and that's the world you've always been in, then that's the world that you're in. And you just do it because that's what everyone else has done. And that's okay if you want to get what everyone else has always got. So take some time over this next couple of days. And obviously we're heading into the, the Christmas season and the, and, the, and the time to spend more time with family anyway. And rather than just talking about the craziness of COVID, ask them these sort of questions and say, hey, you know, it's a bit of a random question. And, and you know, let me know if it's a bit too personal for you. But you know, I'm doing this program and we're talking about money mindset. And I just like to, you know, when you think about making money, what do you think are some of the, the patterns that you've got with regards to money that uh, I can learn from? Or what are some of the lessons you've learned along the way with money? Or have you ever lost money before? Or what do you think about investing into money? And just explore the conversation with no agenda other than the agenda to seek understanding and insight. Because if you can start to have those conversations, you're going to realize a couple of things. When I did this with my family, even just recently, I realized pretty quickly that there were certain conversations that we could have around our dinner table and there's certain conversations we couldn't. There are some topics that very quickly get shut down because it's too emotional for some people. Most people are not happy talking about their failures. Most people are not in the mindset of, if I failed, I can share to you. They're still in the judgment of, I failed, therefore I'm not good enough. So they just want to try and fucking hide it. And when you're dealing with that financial trauma, so to speak, uh, you know, it's a really important one, right? Plus as well, you know, you might know your parents or grandparents as being quite conservative or cautious, but when they were your age, they might have been quite gun ho and buoyant and they just made the wrong decision and then they got burned. And so they fucking were shutting this down. You know, we're not spending any money again. On the flip side, they might have been cautious and conservative their whole lives and gone, you know, maybe you've inspired them to go, maybe I need to live a little, right? You know, I'm sure Liz's grandparents are out there thinking, you know, she's going out partying every weekend. Why can't we get to the court and have a great weekend, you know? So, you know, these are the sort of things that hold people back. Uh, I just have some fun. If you know what the court is, you'll understand that joke. If you don't, you won't. Um, but you understand what I'm trying to say. Having those conversations is going to allow you to not just understand your family and the dynamics, but the broader cultural in your family, the dynamic around money and what that means and what it actually represents. And most people have got a lot of shame and a lot of guilt around it and a lot of uncertainty around it. So they just don't talk about it. And the reason why that they don't talk about it is so they don't talk about it. If they talked about it, they'd air it. They've actually realized I'm okay. It's going to be okay. Move forward from there. Here's the final question I've got for you guys as well. You think forward for uh, 2021. When you think about 2021 and you think about how much money you make, I think I might've touched on this a little bit last week. 
But you think about how much money you won't make this this year right now, and that gives you a certain hourly rate. And you think about how much money you want to make next year, and you think about the hourly rate that that would be. If you keep doing the things that you're already doing, you're only going to make the amount of money that you're already going to make. Like you'll make the same money again because you've got to change your behaviors. You've got to change your capabilities. You've got to change your skill sets. And it's infinitely more valuable to invest early into yourself in this process to learn and get the skills that you can monetize at a higher level than trying just to monetize without having those skills. For me, 2013, sending that six months learning the skills, I didn't make any money. But then I came back and my income exploded because I was investing and learning and developing myself. So if you're not yet in a position financially where you're making $100,000 a year, your first and primary objective is going to be to invest in yourself. Whether you invest in stocks or shares or anything outside of that or, or properties after that, that's all good. But the first objective is to get yourself to $100,000 a year because the difference between 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 or 100,000 a year is dramatic long-term, long-term. You know, the reality is for the world that we all live in, if you're making under $100,000 a year, if you're making 60,000, the expenses to live a $100,000 a year life or the expenses to live a $50,000 a year life are relatively the same. You still need somewhere to live. You still need somewhere to drive. You still spend the same money on a, cafe, on a coffee. So yes, of course, if you make more money, normally your lifestyle expands. Don't get me wrong. But there's, like, there's almost like a ticket to entry in the Western world. And the ticket to entry in the Western world is quite a lot of money for most people just to basically live. So the difference between you living on 50,000 and the difference between you living on 100 is not a lot more expenses, but it is a lot more quality of life. Is everyone following this conversation? Yeah. So imagine you, you, you know, and obviously I know it's slightly different from Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and the United States. There's some variance, but your principle remains the same. If it's, if it's $42,000 to live the average life that we live, well, if you only make 50, you're in a world of pain. But if you make 80, it's much better. If you make 100, it's even better than that again. So every dollar you've got above, and above your living should be spent on developing yourself and not just making yourself feel good, but developing the skills that are incredibly monetized. You know, so going to university is a great idea, providing it's something that's actually going to pay you really well. But most of the time, you don't even need to go to uni. You just go directly to source. You can start making money doing it. And that's why with a lot of the stuff that we're learning and we're teaching you guys around coaching, so valuable because it's the ability to instantly monetize. You can monetize that skill within a week. Learn how to do a breakthrough. Learn how to do a belief change. Start monetizing belief changes. That's as easy as this can be, right? So Learning that though, and the marketing and the sales and all the other stuff that goes into that, that that's the bit that takes a bit of time, but hopefully you're understanding that. So I want you to think about not just how much money do I want to make next year, but I also want you to think about why am I actually really fucking serious about that? Because everyone can say they want to make more, but are you willing to do the work? And what do I need to learn or what do I need to change or what do I need to do differently? What do I need to stop doing and start doing in order for me to bridge that gap? Because otherwise, it's just a pipe dream. And it's like someone saying, I want to lose weight and they're still eating fucking Krispy Kremes. So you got to make sure that you can make that shift and it has to follow through in terms of behaviors. To that extent, if anyone is looking to start a business next year or wants some help with regards to that, please reach out. We've got a 14-day coaches challenge and a business growth program. But over that, we're going to show you sales and marketing and mindset and, and how to acquire customers and do all that stuff. So if you're looking to start your own business, seriously consider doing that. So learning those skills is important. And again, I ask you as well, for a lot of you, if you'd learn how to sell, you'd, be, you'd make a lot more money, right? Who thinks if you're better at sales, you make more money? Cool. The reason why you're not comfortable with selling is because you're not comfortable with money yet. Because if you're comfortable with money and all of the objections that go into making a sale, you wouldn't have any problems with asking people for money. But it's all that stuff around asking and receiving money and all the stuff that comes up with as part of that as well. And Ash was making a great point to me today. You know, We were listening to a, a seminar with a Tony Robbins, top sales trainer. And he said, there's a thing called the, the mirror effect. The law of the mirror. The law of the mirror. Um, it's similar to the... Um, no, I'm not going to just... Get back on the point, Calvin. Uh, so the law of the mirror, which is basically this. If you're an experience where you keep speaking to people and they keep telling you, oh, I need to speak to my partner about it. You're like, oh, yeah, no problems. And then the next person says, I need to speak to my partner. You're like, yeah, no problems. And you're struggling to get somebody to commit to something because of the partner. Well, clearly that's a mirror for you because you haven't figured out your shit with your partner. If you've got a person that keeps saying, oh, yeah, I'll pay, but I need to go on a payment plan and they're constantly doing payment plans, payment plans, payment plans. And you're like, why am I not making more money? It's clear because you keep fucking doing payment plans. 
if you got people that keep uh, re- uh, their bank account keeps getting rejected and you keep getting declined on the on the, on their cards, it's because you're declining on your uh, cards, right? If you're on the phone to people and they keep saying, "Oh, I need to think about it," it's because you're not backing yourself and actually stepping up and making things happen. And you need to keep saying you need to think about it. So eventually, when you work with enough people, they mirror it back to you. No, not not every objection is like that, but for a lot of them, they are. So you've got to do that inner work and getting clear on that. And a couple of key fundamental beliefs to leave you with. One, if you work hard, and I say if you work hard, because some people say they work hard and they don't actually work hard. But if you work hard, then you should absolutely have the belief that you deserve abundance. You deserve everything that life has to give you, right? And there's a lot of people that think I have to work hard to get. No, that's not the case. Hard work and receiving is not the same thing, but they are, they do, they are sisters, brother and sisters. So if I work hard, then I know I've got a better chance of receiving, but I can receive without working hard, but there's got to be a balance. If I'm receiving too much and I'm not contributing, I'm not adding value, I'm not working hard, then eventually that's going to dry up. If I am working hard, I'm not receiving, then I'm not going to be able to continue to work hard because eventually I'm going to feel underappreciated. Does that make sense? So there should be a a balance. But if you're not receiving enough, work harder. But on the same token, if you're working hard and you're not receiving, you need to open yourself to being okay with that and to allowing yourself to receive and and challenge any of the beliefs of unworthiness that you might have that might be present there such that you can manifest and attract what you want. A lot of it comes down to self-confidence and self-worth. You know, just understand this. You get what you ask for. You get what you ask for. So this is a great time of the year. Hands up if you work for somebody right now, part-time or full-time. A couple of you. Awesome. Now is the time of the year that I would be going to my boss and having a sit down conversation and talking about my financial goals for 2021. I'd be sitting down with them in 2021. I'd be sitting down and going, hey, uh, sorry, I'd be sitting down with them now, but in preparation for 2021 and saying, hey, hey, Brennan, I really love this job. Just want to let you know, this is my financial goal next year. I want to be making this much money. Now, right now, you're currently paying me this much money. And obviously I know there's a gap. So what I'd like to know is what do I have to do differently in 2021 to be worth that much money and more? There's a whole script around this in five days to quick crash, quick, quick cash, which is let's say you're on 50, you want to make 70. Great. What do I have to do that would be worth $80,000 to this organization such that you'd be happy to pay me $70,000 to do it? I'll just repeat that frame. And by the way, if you're running your own business, hands if you're running your own business and you're hustling your own stuff, Cool. A couple of you guys are. Excellent. So it's the same frame, right? If you're on the phone or client, you're saying it's a $5,000 product. Say, what would we have to achieve together that would be worth $8,000 such that you'd be happy to pay me $5,000 to achieve it? It's just a contrast frame. So if you speak to your boss and you want 70, you say, great, what would I have to do that would be worth $80,000 for you such that you'd be happy to pay me eighty, pay $70,000 for it? I would be having that conversation right now with my boss and saying, I don't expect you to have an answer straight away, but if you can think about it, I'd love to put a plan in place for 2021 for January when we come back from work, from the holidays. And now I've planted the seed. If, if he or she can't answer that question, right, it's because they don't know and it means you're in the wrong place and you need to look for another job over the Christmas break. But if they can answer it, you can get that. We've got a client in the program right now who applied. She's on 50,000 right now. She applied for a job that's 166,000. 142,000, 125,000. She got accepted for the $166,000 job. If I told you, fucking just quit your $50,000 job and start applying for jobs that are worth 166,000, you'd say you're high as a fucking kite. She did it. Self Mastery Community, check it out. Unbelievable. I'm quitting my job next week. I'm applying for my, my set, the same role, but for three times as much money. So it all comes down to self-confidence, right? And you having the ability to believe in yourself. If Donald Trump can be president of the United States, you guys can get a pay rise. Put it that way. Yeah, it's possible.